I'm Patty Limerick from the Center of the American West. I have the best job on the planet. Hosting this evening is one feature of that quality of having the best job. I'm going to say, before I forget to say it, that as our, our readers come up, you will come in alphabetical order. You have your programs in front of you, except I didn't get a program, so I probably should get a program. Uh, so we are not going to take, oh, thank you. We are not going to take time to introduce people because in so many ways the readers will be presenting themselves. So you will see very short descriptions of each reader. Um, but we will not take time for lengthy biographies because if we do, we'll be having breakfast together. And that doesn't seem what you were planning on doing. So, okay, so that, I'm to tell you that. And then as each reader follows the other, you will engage in a beautiful ritual, which is called the transfer of the lavalier mic. And you will do that in a reverent and respectful <laughs> manner and try not to hurt the other person when you're pinning the mic on them. I once had the great privilege of putting a lavalier mic on the writer Wallace Stegner in front of four or 500 people, and I was so nervous that I almost did do Mr. Stegner some injury as I tried to, <laughs> to uh, do that. But he was a forgiving man, so that was good. Uh, we will... So I think those are my practical, and oh, and then, oh, there's one more, which is as you approach this area, do not walk between the camera and this area. So we will have a record that will not include you passing between the, the camera. So come around this way. Yes. Yeah. Right. Ashley is wonderful, and she's a wonderful student, and she's just a magnetic presence, but do not be drawn in Ashley's direction. Go the other direction on that. Okay, so I am going to make a few opening remarks about this occasion and the person in whose honor we are gathered, and then his daughter, Abby Quillen, will tell us about uh, a little bit about her father and then the uh, publication of this book, which is available outside. So I am a fortunate person. I was invited early on to speak at the Headwaters Conference at Western State. And one of the rewards of doing that was I got to meet Ed Cohen. I think that's when I met him. Is that right, Martha? I think I knew you guys before that, but we'll just go with that. Uh, Ed Quillen was a remarkable person who we recruited into Center of the American West activities as fast as we could. He uh, served as a character witness when we did our urban-rural divorce, and I played Urbana Asphalt West, and a friend plays, uh, played Sandy Sandy Greenhills West and our miserable, poorly governed daughter, Suburbia Greenlawn West, was running around the courtroom causing trouble. Uh, so Ed served as a witness in that preposterous but pretty fun event and in informative and instructive as well. He came and spoke when we uh, released our boom and bust report, and his remarks there were lastingly and illuminating for me because I had never really got it in my head how much some people in the rural West would welcome not, not missing the economic suffering or not dismissing that, but a bust, an economic bust, could be the first time where they could pause in the, in the burst of growth and think about what they were doing. So the notion that a, an economic downturn could deliver that occasion for reflection, I never had that in my mind until I heard Ed say that. Oh, I can see that. I can. So that was the experience of being around Ed Quillen. There's things that you had not thought. You thought, oh, I hadn't seen that, but now, now I'm getting it. Uh, he invited me to speak a number of quite a number of years ago at Puncha Springs, where he organized an annual event, not exactly a celebration, but a tribute to Juan Bautista de Anza, who was the Spanish explorer who came into Southern Colorado, the most the most northern. Uh, exploration of the Spanish Empire, and we were, those of us who were privileged to give the Anza speech, got to uh, talk to, actually it was a scary audience, because there were at least three or four people who knew everything about Juan Bautista de Anza, and it was terrifying to see them in the audience, and one of the happier moments of my life was when the Anza expert said, that was pretty good, <laughs> saved, uh, but with Ed's encouragement, I gave him a rather peculiar but lasting speech, it's in a collection of essays, if you ever want to see it, with his encouragement, I followed in those traditions of business management books where you take a figure. There actually was a book drawing lessons from Sitting Bull for Sitting Bull's life that business managers could profit from. So I did, I did 10 lessons from Juan Bautista de Anza's life that business managers and 
government bureaucrats should follow. So it will not last for the ages, but it was really, <laughs> it's really fun to have that, that occasion. Ed Quillen was a public intellectual. And when we use that term, for some reason we've fallen into the habit of thinking of people in universities who go outside the borders of that. And he did go inside the borders of universities from time to time, and that was invigorating for all to have him in there. But he was just an omnivorous reader, an uncontrollable thinker. He just, anything put in front of him, he would reflect on it and come up with something that none of us saw, saw coming. He uh, was... Born in Greeley, he lived outside Greeley in Evans. He studied at um, Greeley has become a very interesting place in Colorado at this point with this, the issues of oil and gas development. And we are soon to start some Center of the American West appearances in Greeley talking about oil and gas development. And I would give anything to have Ed Quillen's guidance on how to present ourselves in that in that community, and some of his guidance I would take, and other parts I would think, hmm, <laughs> I'm not really sure I want to get their backs up quite that fast. So, uh, so he had, um, he did come and go at the University of Northern Colorado, and that was really good because while he was at the University of Colorado, he met Martha, who is here tonight, and they married in the summer of 1969. They had two children, one of whom is here with us tonight, Abby, and the Next generation is in the vicinity. Oh, they're, the next generation, the Aquilan grandchildren are playing with Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head, who are honorary <laughs> fellows at the Center of the American West. And they are. <laughs> so it's lucky we have them because we don't really have anything else for children to do at the center besides Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head. He wrote, uh, he and Martha were enterprising. I, I'm sure he, what would he have thought if I said he was entrepreneurial? He founded things, got things going. Um, they were founders of um, Colorado Central. They ran that for a while. They wrote, oh, for heaven's sake, what lives. I'm not going to take too much time on this because you'll be hearing a little bit more reminiscence from people. But they, they wrote adult westerns as ghost writers. And between the two of them, they converged in a pseudonym named John Sharp. So they, there's Martha and Ed who become John Sharp. But then there were other people who were also John Sharp who were writing the this is one reason why I don't read fiction so much anymore, because people just live lives where the John Sharps of the world are writing these, these uh, novels. They wrote Confederate Challenge, Santa Fe Slaughter, Colorado Robber, Minnesota Missionary, Smoky Hell Trail, Utah Slaughtered. Slaughter is a little bit of a theme there, I can say. Yeah. <laughs> there are Texas Hell Country, Mexican Massacre, not Slaughter, but Massacre, Cave of Death, and Desperate Dispatch. So, so uh, some kind of madcap and wild adventures there, but collected here the real uh, core of the legacy that we have from this man columns that just brightened our days when we opened the Denver Post and the news was not good but we knew if we just powered on to the editorial page we would have a bright and engaging voice that would uh, not dismiss the things we had seen before that troubled us but give us a perspective and an angle I think it is cool that he was active in the Salida Business Alliance. Word business and okay, so that's a but such a uh, such a presence in the in the town of Salida, such a figure in that in that place. I was there this summer. Two young people at the center, affiliated with the center, had chosen to be married in Salida. So I was in Salida presiding over a wedding and the summer, and just thinking, this is an excellent place to be starting a marriage between these two young people. And the reason, one reason to think that is that Ed and Martha had an extraordinary marriage and they had extraordinary kids. And we are now about to make an excellent transition to one of those kids, Abby Quillen, who will tell us a little bit about this book and about her father. And now we engage in the most excellent ritual here of the Bible And you can put that in the pocket and just put it there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hello, thank you. What an honor to be here tonight. This would have been my dad's 63rd birthday today. And it's just so wonderful to be here celebrating him today. I'm not sure how many of you got to hear him speak while he was still alive. I had the pleasure of seeing him in 1998 when he released his first anthology, 
deep in the heart of the Rockies, he came to the Tatter Cover Bookstore. And I actually worked there at the time, so mm -hmm. in the weeks before the event, I was terrified. I knew everything was going to go wrong. Maybe nobody would show up, or maybe all of my coworkers would show up, and he would tell embarrassing stories about me all night to entertain them. So we get there that night to the Tatter Cover Cherry Creek store. We're climbing the stairs, and there's some people there. So we're feeling, I'm feeling a little relieved, still kind of nervous. Like someone's going to show up other than us. My dad goes up. He's preparing his remarks, and people start coming. They start filling up. The aisles are full by the time he starts speaking. There are people standing at the back of the room. My dad starts speaking, and we are howling with laughter within minutes. He... I don't know if you've ever been to a comedy club, but our faces hurt, our stomachs hurt, we're just, the delirium of laughter is in the air. He's hilarious. And he did tell an embarrassing story about me that night. But little did he know that 15 years later, I would be here tonight to enact my revenge. But really, I never worried about him speaking in public again. He was a great entertainer, and I wish he were here tonight to entertain all of us. But you have me. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about this book that I've been working on for a little more than a year. Nobody remembers whose idea it was. Um, we all have blamed each other and taken credit at different moments of the process. But um, people just started talking about a second anthology within days of my dad's passing. And uh, we started talking more seriously about it in the months afterward. And I agreed to take it on sounded like a, an interesting project and also the kind of memorial my dad would love. So um, it was a pretty huge amount of archives. We want, I wanted to start where we left off with the last one at 1999. So we are looking at 13 years of columns, about 1,500 of them. So it was a pretty big project. So of course, my dad was a self-described sloth, although that was, didn't quite characterize him. He liked to call himself that. So I knew he would want me to share the labor on this project, so I looked for some help. And many of those people are here tonight, including Cohen Pert, who is, was my dad's editor at the Mountain, or at the Denver Post. And he helped so much. Um, he did some reading and some selecting. Alan Best, who's sitting right here, also helped with that process. And my mom, Martha Quillen. Also, my dad's college friend, Bill Hayes, who is not here this evening. And my husband, Aaron Thomas, who is sitting out there, did also did some selecting. So we worked through that bulk of columns, and we were looking for ones that stood the test of time, that would entertain a general audience, that were funny, a lot of funny in there, and that would make us think. And we came up with quite a few. The categories that we chose for um, kind of evolved as the project did. Um, I picked things that made sense to me, but also that I was hearing from his fans and readers that they were interested in. Like Anna Nice Ziegler was a very um, popular popular one. So that's that's the categories that you'll see in the book. Um, it was, uh, after we chose the columns, Cohen graciously pulled the edited versions from the Denver Post, and I figured since they were edited, I would just slap them together into a book, and it would be really easy. But that wasn't quite the case, but it was a lot of fun. I had a great time working on it. Um, it was a very healing project for me. I um, worked through these I got to read his columns in a time where I was really missing him and kind of have this more one-way conversation, but I loved talking to my dad. He was an amazing conversationalist, so to get this opportunity to hear him speak to me was really priceless at that time. And I also became a huge fan of his column in a way that I had never really gotten the opportunity to you know, be. Like, I always read his work. I mean, I shouldn't say always, but I, I read a lot of his work over the years, but I had never explored it quite to this extent. And my dad spent his entire life working on this form, the 750-word, roughly, essay. And by the time, by 1999, he had mastered this form. He put in far more than 1,000 hours, which they say is what you're supposed to put in to master something. He started writing these short essays in college for the Mirror, Greeley's um, newspaper, we actually tracked some of those down. Pretty radical, pretty radical stuff he was writing. Um, he mellowed over the years. But. And he also just got exceptionally good at that form. And these columns in this book really sparkle. They, you could just, they're fun. They're really fun to read, and I had a great time. This book is definitely a collaboration. I mentioned a lot of people who helped. Hal Walter took that stunning photo on the cover. 
My husband did a lot of the design of the book, and he's out there um, in the lobby. And um, Alan Best wrote the foreword, which is really wonderful. So we also had many generous donors who helped us with the book. You can see some of their names at the back of the book, and maybe some of you are in the room. So thank you so much. You made this book possible. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Look at this, these readers are so ready to roll. So readers, you are not going to be summoned to keep track of your name. You've probably been doing that most of your lives, so that'll be easy to do. But then come up in sequence, and we'll begin here with Alan Best. This piece was published February 22nd, 2005. It's titled To Write Like Cutter S. I chose it because it talks about craft. And in talking about the craft, he talks about purpose, why you write on your better days. And of course, it's always something you're chasing. He talks something about one part of that chasing and trying to do something more than just simply entertain. One thing you may need to know in hearing this to understand, there's a mention of somebody called Liesl Almond. Now, in 1997, she was perhaps immature. She certainly made some mistakes. Most fundamentally, she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And according to the laws, she was sentenced to life in prison to no great act of her own. Ed was one of the very first to recognize this injustice and to call our, our attention to it. He wasn't the last. Westwood was there, Diane Carmen of the Denver Post. Uh, at some point, Hunter Thompson, and along with Hunter Thompson, a lot of movie actors, Johnny Depp, etc. She walks free today, in part because of what Ed did, I do believe. Every time I sit down to write, I want to create the perfect opening paragraph. That is, one that so grabs the reader that he drops everything and thinks, I've got to read the rest of this right now. And in nearly 50 years of reading, I've encountered only two such openers. One began a short story, an imperfect conflagration, written in the 1880s by Ambrose Bierce. Early one June morning in 1872, I murdered my father, an act which made a deep impression on me at the time. <laughs> The other, by Hunter S. Thompson, appeared in 1971. We were somewhere around Barstow, on the edge of the desert, when the drugs began to take hold. I remember saying something like, I feel a bit lightheaded. Maybe you should drive. <laughs> and suddenly, there was a terrible roar all around us, and the sky was full of what looked like huge bats, all sweeping, swooping and screeching and diving around the car which was going about 100 miles an hour with the top down to Las Vegas. In December 1913, Bierce rode a horse into Mexico, which was then suffering from a civil war. He had earlier written to a friend, if you hear of my being stood up against a Mexican stone wall and shot to rags, please know that I think that a pretty good way to depart this life. It beats old age, disease, or falling down the cellar stairs. To be a gringo in Mexico, ah, that is euthanasia. <laughs> and then he vanished. Although the last adventures inspired a fine novel, Gringo Viejo by Carlos Fuentes, and a decent movie, The Old Gringo, based on the novel. Thompson killed himself over the weekend, I have no idea why, and the one time I ever talked to him, he called me in the wee hours once to talk about the Lisa Lama case. I was rather tongue-tied and starstruck, for he might have been the most influential journalist of the late 20th century. Thompson's famous gonzo style didn't just hatch one morning. If you read the best collection of his work, The Great Shark Hunt, which came out in 1979, you'll find a lot of great, more or less traditional journalism, much of it written 
from South America for mainstream publications. As with this, from 1969, excuse me, 1963. When the cold Andean dusk comes down on Cusco, the waiters hurry to shut down the Venetian blinds in the lounge of the big hotel in the middle of town. They do it because the Indians come up on the stone porch and stare at the people inside. It tends to make tourists uncomfortable, so the blinds are pulled. The tall, oak-paneled room immediately seems more cheerful. Then came his 1966 book, Hell's Angels. He didn't just interview people and quote police authorities. He got into the story so deeply that he ended up getting stumped. A friend in college was highly impressed by the book and urged me to read it. So I did. And when we encountered that memorable 1971 opening Barstow paragraph in Rolling Stone magazine, we checked to see if it was the same Hunter Thompson who had written the Hell's Angels book. It was. And Thompson was at his prime then, writing not only what he saw, but speculating about what might be happening, making himself a character who might be half crazy, but that made him a lot saner than the full-bore lunatics who ran our country. <laughs> Thompson had some good effects on American journalism. He loosened it up with a vicious style that captured the situation in just a few words. In the 1972 Democratic primaries, Hunter Hump Hubert Humphrey campaigned like a rat in heat. And Edward Muskie sounded like a farmer with terminal cancer trying to borrow money on next year's crop. <laughs> he had some bad effects on American journalists of my generation, many of whom seemed to think that creativity required trunk loads of uncontrollable substances and that bragging about your consumption somehow improved your writing. I yearned to be able to write like Thompson or Beers. Beers fought the good fight against the railroad barons that dominated California politics. Thompson was more of an idealist than the cynical Beers, as evidenced in 1973. What a fantastic monument to the better instincts of the human race this country might have been if we could have kept it out of the hands of greedy little hustlers like Richard Nixon. The greedy little hustlers are still running this country 32 years later. Good writing only goes so far, no matter how compelling the opening paragraph. Mm -hmm. yes. The fact that you're here, I think, is a testament to the Ted's ability to deliver openers and closers. One of the uh, many pleasures of reading Ed's writing is uh, being reminded of the peculiar virtues of being far out west and high in the air. Um, it, certain things just don't agitate us uh, the way they do people back east, for instance. Uh, and an example of this is the uh, piece I'm going to read, which was published on March 4th, 2003, and it's called What Else is Useful for Security? It was a pleasant surprise recently when I read that we civilians can assist with homeland security in case of an attack. <laughs> Not that I'd been w real worried about an attack. During World War II, Salida was a significant railroad junction where trains were dispatched to important defense production facilities like the Monarch Quarry, limestone for the steel mills in Pueblo, Crested Butte, coal for the steel mills in Pueblo, and Climax Molybdenum, Molybdenum hardened steel for better armor and cannon barrels. On that account, I have been told, soldiers patrolled constantly to guard against potential sabotage in this area. But that was 60 years ago, and this time around, Salida is not an important place. It does not have a population concentration. Famous people do not cavort here 
and nothing nearby is of symbolic value. The closest national monument, soon to be a national park, is the great sand dunes, and the dunes are so expendable that they were a leading candidate for the test site for the first atomic bomb in 1945. <laughs> Even so, it never hurts to be prepared, and some of us felt rather prescient when the Homeland Security Administration announced that people should keep plastic sheeting and duct tape on hand so that windows could be sealed of terrorist-released anthrax or the like. This is a familiar drill if you're an economically challenged rural resident, we run through it every fall, along about Halloween, at our first house in Salida. The current house has decent storm windows, except on the back porch where plastic remains in use. Granted, we were trying to keep out cold air rather than anthrax spores, <laughs> but the principle is the same. And I wish they consulted me so I could pass on my experience with what were then known as Reaganomics storm windows. <laughs> Initially, I tried, to, I tried the suggested homeland security method, plastic on the interior, held by duct tape. It doesn't work well because duct tape is made to be wrapped around ducts. <laughs> the adhesive doesn't hold well when the tape is run along the flat seam between plastic and wall or window frame. Thus, to get everything to stay up, you need a heavy-duty staple gun, and the resulting staple holes along with the gouge marks that result when you remove staples with fencing pliers, make a mess of the window frame, which means filler and paint when you could be drinking beer with your friends and discussing how safe you feel now that there's a Department of Homeland Security. <laughs> Interior plastic is also subject to attack by cats, projectile toys, and curious toddlers. To be sure, some people live in apartments far above ground level and they'll need to apply plastic on the interior. But for the rest of us, exterior plastic works better. Don't mess with duct tape, except for patching when the wind blows sharp twigs that tear the plastic. Instead, staple the plastic in place, then frame the plastic with narrow wood slats. If you can afford it, a flat screen molding from the, the lumber, uh, if you can afford it, flat screen molding from the lumberyard works well, if you're scrounging, a cabinet shop scrap pile is a good place to start. This will make almost any drafty old house somewhat secure, but it raises a question I haven't seen in the security information. If you make the place so tight that spores can't enter, won't you eventually run out of oxygen and die of <laughs> suffocation? And if you're getting fresh air from some exterior sort, aren't you still in danger? Better not to wonder about such matters, I suppose. <laughs> Instead, I pondered whether any of our other small-town ways might, like window plastic, be of some use for homeland security. There are many wood piles, for instance. Most are neatly stacked, but there are quite a few like mine. Having cordwood on hand does make you feel more secure about getting through a utility disruption that could result from terrorism. But I can't imagine this administration promoting wood heat for homeland security, since good Americans should rely on multinational oil companies. <laughs> Some of my fellow Salidans store old tires in their yards. I had thought I was, uh, it was just because they didn't care to spend the $3 tire disposal fee. But then again, if the terrorists launch a mosquito attack, the tires could be ignited to produce smudge to repel the insects. <laughs> Many local yards also have junk piles, usually near the alley. And for all I know, there might come a time when our homeland security will require half a bed frame, a rustic tractor seat, a cream separator, a wheelbarrow that has no wheel, or a gas barbecue with a dead burner. Not that I know how these items might improve homeland security, but until recently, I didn't know that plastic on our windows could have anything to do with national defense either. It's a joy to be with you on this special occasion, Dennis Gallagher, honored to be the city auditor for our city of Denver, and I am honored tonight to read 
Why bother to learn the Colorado dialect? <coughs> Written November 28, 1999. An article in the Denver Post last week explained why many newcomers to Colorado try hard to fit in by buying SUVs and driving on six-block errands, but give themselves away by their speech. Just why anyone would want to sound like a local is hard to understand. If you're a potential newcomer, Colorado woos you with tax breaks and expanded highways. Then Colorado takes you for granted while it uses your money to recruit more people to congest your neighborhood. My best advice as a 49-year resident is to sound like you're rich and from Orange County looking for places to build a private airport and a 27-hole golf course surrounded by a gated enclave where lots start at $750,000. You'll get a hearty welcome, even if you say Colorado instead of Colorado. <laughs> Not all people will take to this advice, though, and over the years I've noticed some particular, peculiar pronunciations. The weirdest came one night on the TV news about 15 years ago, the announcer, a new arrival, began a segment with, two people were aboard a small plane which crashed this morning in Conejos County. <laughs> Martha turned to me, Ed, you've lived here in this state all your life, where is Conejos County? I've never heard of it. <laughs> Neither had I. <laughs> After some mental struggle, I realized that the announcer must have meant Conejos County. But if we use the Spanish pronunciation for Conejos, why not for Salida? <coughs> we were supposed to, according to a local paper of 1880, for the benefit of all concerned, we will say the word is pronounced Salida, and for the past 119 years, it's been locally mispronounced as Salida. Much of the same holds for Buena Vista, which should be Buena Vista, but is instead pronounced Buena Vista, <laughs> except that people normally shorten it to Buni. <laughs> Mayor Clint Driscoll has recently decreed that the proper spelling of Buni is with the umlaut, with a, uh, the U, with an umlaut over it. Mm. <laughs> Neither Salida nor Buena Vista, despite the Iberian names, represents a legacy of the conquistadors. The only documented Spanish visit was one trip in 1799 by Juan Batista de Anza. And while his place names often remained elsewhere, the one he applied here didn't stick. And place names, Salida and Buena Vista, represent the New Mexico writer's Stanley Crawford comment called the leading commercial dialect of the American Southwest, real estate Spanish. <laughs> it's the dialect that pronounces names like table, mesa, <laughs> lake, Laguna, <laughs> Cerro, Heights. In Colorado, Pancha Pass is a boundary. Given a Spanish-looking place name, pronounce it Anglo if it's in the north of the pass, like Salida or Buena Vista, and if it's in the south, like Canejos or Castilla, use the Spanish pronunciation. This doesn't cover everything, though. Monta Vista is usually just Monte, and the final vowel in del norte is seldom pronounced. However, these towns were originally Anglo developments just like Salida and Buena Vista, rather than Anglo villages like San Luis, rather than San Luis, and in good Coloradese, 
San Luis Valley is pronounced the valley, while other depressions get specified as in the South Park and Wet Mountain Valley. Thus, a guide to the proper Colorado pronunciation of Spanish place names would have to indicate whether the name came from real Spanish or real estate Spanish. <laughs> and I suspect that most Coloradans, be they new arrivals or fifth generation ranchers running for office, with that as their major qualification, don't care. <laughs> Nor would such knowledge help with the Ute names like Sawach, S-A-G-U-A-C-H-E, and Uncompare, U-N-C-O-M-P-A-H-G-R-E, or French names like La Porte and Cash La Poudre, or a Quechua name like Cotopaxi, locally pronounced Paxi, except the road head heading south is the Cotopaxi cutoff. You would not learn to pronounce the Purgatoire River as the Picket Wire. Also, pronunciation isn't the only way newcomers reveal themselves. If you really want to sound like an established Peckerwood Coloradan, here are a few hints. Never refer to Copper Mountain, always call it Wheeler Junction. In Canyon City, call the main drag River Street rather than Royal Gorge Boulevard. The entire sprawl from Fort Collins South to Castle Rock is known as Denver. And then <laughs> there's the Springs. And as I have pointed out earlier, there's no good reason to learn these things. You'll get, get treated better if people think you're rich and from somewhere else and very interested in buying property in Colorado, no matter how you mispronounce it. I hope Ed is resting with the angels and they were there to welcome him to paradise. Well, if there's nothing else that I loved about Ed, it was his political activism. He was fearless in defending civil liberties. This uh, essay is called A Good Decision That Could Have Been Stronger, April 14, 2002. <clears throat> Sometimes the best reading lies between the lines. And by the process, last week's decision by the Colorado Supreme Court provides some insight into the twisted minds that conduct the war on drugs in this country. This tale started out in March 13, 2000, when agents of the North Metro Drug Task Force looked through the trash from a mobile home in Adams County that they had been monitoring. They found evidence of drug operations as well as a mailing container from the tattered cover bookstore addressed to one trailer occupant. The envelope bore invoice and customer numbers but did not indicate the contents. The task force got a search warrant and searched the mobile home the next day. Inside the master bedroom, they found a meth lab, various other items, and two books about how to make meth. Even though they had their suspicions, the police did not know which person, of several possibilities, actually occupied the master bedroom and presumably cooked the meth. But there was the mailing container in the trash, plus the books. If they could get the bookstore records to show that the books had been ordered by a certain person, they'd have a better case, or so they said. What they were really doing was something else. Their true purpose was not to gather evidence to convict someone of a crime. Instead, they were trying to harass a bookstore that sold material they didn't approve of. And if they had succeeded, bookstores in the future might well decide that no matter what the Bill of Rights says, it would be too much trouble to fill certain customer orders. How do we know this was harassment instead of a good faith search for evidence? By reading between the lines of the state Supreme Court decision. The court observed that the police had many other ways to establish who was making crank. 
The master bedroom in the trailer appears to have been a typical bedroom containing clothes, furniture, papers, and other personal objects. Clothes and shoes could have been examined to see if the sizes matched. Objects could have been fingerprinted. The bed and flooring could have been examined for hair or other DNA samples. There are numerous witnesses that the city likely could have interviewed. In other words, the police had plenty of evidence to gather and examine by the usual methods. But instead, they decided to harass a store for selling the wrong kind of book. For further evidence that this was their true purpose, observe what followed. The usual method would be to ask for records, and if that didn't work, to subpoena the records. And upon receiving the subpoena, the tattered cover could have either complied or contested it in a hearing before a court. But instead of requesting a subpoena that might have led to a hearing, the task force went shopping for a prosecutor who would request a search warrant. The Adams County District Attorney's Office properly refused. So the task force went to Denver. If Bill Ritter, the Denver District Attorney at the time, has any sense of shame, this fact has escaped public notice. So his office requested and got a search warrant from a judge who should have known better. In general, you don't get to contest a search warrant. This makes sense. For example, if the trailer occupants had received notice of the search warrant and the opportunity to contest it, they would likely have destroyed the evidence. But the tattered cover wasn't a suspect, and there was no reason to fear it would destroy the relevant records. The search warrant was just another way to harass places where people might buy books that don't bear the North Metro task Force, Drug Task Force stamp of approval. Fortunately, the tattered cover had attorneys on hand when Ritter's forces appeared with the warrant, and that led to last week's Supreme Court decision. The court did not grant an absolute right to privacy concerning book purchases. It said that law enforcement agencies should first exhaust other means for gathering evidence and then go through an adversarial hearing rather than just get a search warrant. And when the request was based on the content of a book, as it was in this case, then the hurdle should be high because our state constitution guarantees that every person shall be free to speak, write, or publish whatever he will on any subject. Since police officers and prosecutors take oaths to support the constitution of the state of Colorado, and here they acted purposefully against our constitution by harassing a bookseller, for example, they didn't pursue other evidence and they sought a, book, a search warrant instead of a subpoena, I wish our Supreme Court had addressed a proper punishment for these scope flaws. For example, does deliberate subversion of our Constitution constitute treason? And if so, would the death penalty be appropriate? <laughs> Despite the bleeding heart omission, though, it was a good decision. If liberty means anything, it should mean that you can buy any book you want without ending up on some police list. <laughs> This is a man I so much admired, Ed Quillen. And I wrote this uh, the day I heard of his death. First Amendment Quillen is what I wrote. Incomparable wit, the First Amendment glories in Ed Quillen. And you know from Art, that was a wonderful reading of that column. I was so glad to be able to vote for that decision. It was the right decision. When we take an oath of office to be a justice of, the, of your court like I, like I am, you swear to uphold the First Amendment. Well, Ed Quillen upheld the First Amendment every time he had a thought or took his pen up. And I followed his columns. I mean, it's the first thing I read in the paper the day that his column was due. And I would often send him a comment, which he would discreetly not publicize to anybody, because I don't think I'm supposed to be talking with journalists that way. But Ed, Ed Quillen was different. He, uh, in my mind, he had the same kind of wit and wisdom as, uh, well, let's say Abraham Lincoln or Will Rogers. I mean, that's, that's the kind of wit and wisdom that came through in his type of, uh, of irony. So I'm very pleased to have selected a 
reading that isn't in the book, although I think it should be. <laughs> Next edition. Uh, and so my uh, practice before Governor Romer appointed me to the court uh, was water law. And, uh, and we do the direct appeals from the seven water courts. And so I particularly enjoy this one. And I read it several times. And like good poetry, an Ed Quillen column needs to be read out loud. That's why it's so good to be with you. So this one is called uh, Water is Easier to Understand <coughs> If You Treat It Like a Religion. <laughs> Back when I made editorial hiring decisions for various small-town newspapers, I theorized that I could simplify the process by requiring applicants to take a simple essay test. In 200 words or less, explain the difference between a conditional and an adjudicated water right, and define what role is played by due diligence in the process. The main reason that I never use this test is that anyone who could pass it would be someone I'd be in awe of. And that would have ruined office discipline <laughs> in a workplace where I was supposed to be in charge. <laughs> but in recent years, I've decided that the best way to approach Colorado water law and administration is to minimize the legal and technical issues and look at it as though it were a variety of religion. After all, there's a doctrine of prior appropriation, an old propaganda for various irrigation schemes that speaks of redeeming land as though the terrain had somehow sinned. <laughs> but with some reservoirs and canals, virtue would triumph, and the prophet Isaiah would be right that the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. The Kalo water religion has a priesthood of attorneys and engineers who understand important matters that are beyond the comprehension of mere lay people like us. It has synods, seas, and presbyteries in the form of special water courts, conservation districts, and conservancy districts. Like all worthy religions, Kala Water has a charismatic prophet, John Wesley Powell. And his utterances are like those of most oracles, subject to interpretation that can support just about any view you want to advance. <laughs> You can quote Pell about the scenic glories of the free-flowing Colorado River through its labyrinthian canyons. And you can quote Pell about how the West would become a better place after the last drop had been diverted from the natural channel of the Colorado River and put to beneficial use. In other religions, people argue about the meanings of words and phrases in the sacred text. And the same is true for our Kalwater denomination. The definitions of diversion and beneficial use are being examined again this week in the Division I Water Court in Greeley, which handles cases in the South Platte drainage. The city of Golden has applied for a water right in Clear Creek for a kayak course. That raises some doctrinal questions. If the water is flowing through its natural course in the creek bed, how is this a diversion? In general, water has to be removed from its natural course by some artificial means, a dam, a weir, a pump, etc., in order for there to be a diversion. There have been some arguments that placing boulders in the stream and otherwise adjusting it for better kayaking does represent a change in the normal course. Thus, it's a diversion. That does seem like a stretch. But such extensions are not unusual in religious discussion. <laughs> and is floating through the water in a small boat a beneficial use? <laughs> Golden municipal officials point out that kayakers bring about $4 million a year into town. So there are economic benefits to this use of water. 
just as there are economic benefits to irrigating cornfields or supplying subdivisions. But the Kalwar scriptures were formed in the late 19th century. And the revelations to the founders did not include the vision that there was any economic value in leaving water in a stream. To them, that was wasting a scarce and valuable resource that could be used in sluice boxes, long toms, rockers, stamp mills, and potato fields. <laughs> but in modern Colorado, water in the banks leads to money in the bank. <laughs> The most recent numbers at hand are from 1997, and they concern only Chafee County, which of course is where people should go for kayaking and rafting, assuming that they plan on spending a lot of money in the process. <laughs> most water diverted here from the Arkansas River and its tributaries goes to agriculture, and total agricultural sales were 5,000,097, mostly cattle and calves, hay and nursery and greenhouse stock. Tourism, much of it based on fishing and float trips down the river, brought in at least 34 million, nearly seven times as much as agriculture. Color water doctrines will adjust. After all, there is one supreme commandment in our hydraulic religion, enunciated by former Governor Love in Colorado, Water flows toward money. So I wrote this poem in response to him, sent it off. Quillen on religion. Quillen, the journalist from Salida, that's not on the west slope of the Divida, <laughs> is a pretty witty water column rata. Ed has said enough of dreary, weary water engineers, judicial drones, and other draining drudges. Lawyers spouting beneficial use and diligence. Enough of gradients, aquifers, formations, channels, deformations, gravity, and bemoaning technical nonsense and leaps of logic, however legal, hydraulic, geologic. He'd have them all be priests, every blessed one of them, and set them loose on desert peoples preaching roses, corn, redemption, jobs, fun, scenery, and other watery theology. But Ed it must be said, is fond of irony, a form of art entirely lost on literalists when divining deeper metaphors. The very kind those higher water priests are famous for, which proves this water columnist not too much the atheist. He was no atheist. He was a believer in democracy and the First Amendment. Thank you, Ed. So I have chosen a selection with a concluding line with which I do not agree, and yet uh, because actually, as uh, probably some of you know, I am myself a lot fonder of elected and appointed public officials than this concluding line conveys. But I chose Plight of the Dog Catcher from 2010 for two good reasons. First, because it is hard for me to believe that Ed Cullen would have liked a session in his honor in which we all went into a group hug, sang Kubaya, and declared that we were all now of one mind. That doesn't seem like something he would have wanted. And second, because this piece is characteristically funny, and so it charms me and wins me over, even as I am firmly disagreeing with the last line. Well, not firmly, but kind of disagreeing with the last line. Um, actually, pretty solidly disagreeing with the last line. Okay. <laughs> so, and it also shows Ed at work, um, just getting interested in a historical question of where did something come from, and why is it that way? So. Here is Plight of the Dog Catcher from August 22, 2010. This will bring some nostalgia for a recent political contest here in this first paragraph. Lately, I've seen statements like these about the Republican nominee for governor, Don May Dan Mays, that, quote, the guy has no business being dog catcher, and I wouldn't vote for him for dog catcher. 
I've used the term in this political context. In 1992, I referred to anyone, quote, anyone above the level of dog catcher, and a year earlier to quote every election from dog catcher to the White House. Let's ponder the two political meanings of dog catcher. One, the lowest elected office, and two, a job so simple that only a total incompetent could fail at it. As a young person, I remember elections for town trustees and mayors, for municipal clerks and treasurers, for school boards and sanitation boards, for offices that have since been abolished, like county school superintendent and county su surveyor, but never for municipal dog warren, warden or county superintendent of canine control. I have poured through 19th century newspapers from our mining camps where sometimes they elected constables whose duties included rounding up stray drunks and donkeys, but never a dog catcher. As nearly as I can tell, dog catcher has never been an elective office in Colorado. As to the job skills, when I worked in Breckenridge, I admired the labor-saving saving methods of the two dog catchers. One explained to me that they'd find a bitch in heat either in the pound or running loose at the start of their patrol, and then troll the streets with her in the back of their truck. <laughs> <laughs> Unconfined male dogs came running and were easily picked up. <laughs> I don't know if any questions about entrapment or anything else there, but that's why I didn't like that. Entrapment is good? Yeah, I have a Supreme Court justice here for these moments. But, but obviously the job isn't always that easy, as you can tell from the Animal Cop Show on the Animal Planet channel. So how did dog catcher become a political insult? The Oxford English Dictionary provided no help, but a contributor to that work, New York lawyer and entomologist Barry Puppick, has found that in some jurisdictions in the 19th century, dog catchers were elected, although it was, quote, the lowest position on the ballot. His earliest political reference is from the February 26, 1889 edition of the Courier Journal of Louis, Louisville, uh, Kentucky. And, quote, an insolent Republican newspaper asserts that Mr. President Grover Cleveland is so unpopular in Washington that he could not be elected dog catcher for the district. In 1891, a Chicago newspaper referred to a man who could not be elected dog catcher in Kansas. In another story a month later, that paper quoted someone saying, you could not be elected dog catcher in your ward. Dog catchers have remained part of our political discourse. In part, I suspect that's because they're rather unpopular with dog owners, a large and vocal group that includes me. Even so, I quit using the term, and here's why. After I last used it in 1992, I got a letter from a woman in Adams County. Her husband, she wrote, was an animal control officer. It was hard work, occasionally dangerous, but he loved animals. His job made their community a safer and better place. So why was I demeaning dog catchers? She was right. Dog catchers generally do improve our communities at some risk to themselves. So why insult them by comparing them to politicians? <laughs> I wanted, uh, I, I was greedy and put two in, and I just want to take very quickly a moment because it's such an important topic and it's not well handled by many of us in life. So, this is a, a great book behind Troy. This is about a movie called Troy that, had take, that was a takeoff or it was an adaptation of the Iliad. And the first astonishing thing in this essay is, is this uh, the statement about how how Ed read the Iliad, and his, his omnivorous reading is really astounding. Some of us were talking about that, and it was just beyond belief, all the things he read. But here is a wonderful way to read the Iliad. Uh, the epic, this epic was made for many nightly installments from a bard at a campfire, so do not try to read it in one sitting. At the time, my daughters still wanted a bedtime story, so I read them a piece of the Iliad every night over several months. I mean, how old were you? This <laughs> is so funny to me. Eight. Okay, this is perfect for eight-year-olds, so. <laughs> Going slowly, we had time to look up everything we didn't understand. From greaves, baseball catchers wear them, though they're usually called shin guards now, to Grecian goddesses. The kids loved the Iliad, a tale of violence and magic and human passions from the sordid to the sublime. And as Frazee has predicted, I learned much about literature from Homer. 
so uh, we move on to some really important <coughs> remarks that I'm, I'm taking other people's time, so I'm going to paraphrase a little bit here about how well Homer conveys the humanity of soldiers and warriors does not dehumanize the enemy and, and recognizes that these soldiers, these warriors are in fact uh, fathers and sons and brothers. So that's important. Uh, but this last con concluding paragraph, uh, two paragraphs. Whether you see the movie Troy or not, you ought to read the book. Although it should be required in every American school as one of the foundations of our literature, the pecksniffs of both the left, violence and the objectification of women, and right, it's totally pagan, and there's the homosexual relationship between Achilles and Patroclus, will ensure that it's never on a public school curriculum in this country. So read it yourself, or even better, read it to your kids. <laughs> It's about blood and guts and fate and valor and treachery, the unsanitized, unsanitized stuff of life and death. And it's a great story. <laughs> so I grew up I should do this first. So I grew up on pavement, first 33 years of my life in Jackson Heights, Queens. And so I really, uh, anything, and I've never learned, been in Colorado for 39 years, and I never have learned to grow along. So that's why I chose this book, uh, this reading. How did lawns get here August 27, 2002? Especially during this drought, you seldom hear a good word about those thirsty bluegrass lawns that currently wither across the inhabited areas of Colorado. Even so, they have their defenders, and any day now I expect to see a bumper sticker that says, I will give up my lawn when you pry my cold, dead fingers off the nozzle. <laughs> Rather than delve into that controversy, though, we should ponder why we have lawns and lilacs. lilacs. They're not native. They weren't, didn't just sprout. Somebody had to plant them and arrange for a water supply to maintain them. It's a lot of work. Especially when our pioneers had so much else to do back when they were defrauding Native Americans, watering railroad stock, pr promoting worthless mines, hunting federal subsidies, exploiting immigrant labor, and exterminating grizzly bears. <laughs> when you read the history of many Colorado towns, be they in the mountains or the plains, you see a pattern. The town site promoter acquires land, subdivides it, and starts selling lots at inflated prices. The first order of this land office business is to snag, is to snag a post office. But even before, th before the first saloon or whorehouse gets off to a good start, they're digging irrigation ditches that lead to the trees they're planting along the streets. The bigger picture is that instead of ad adapting themselves to the landscape, the Colorado immigrants of 1860 to 1900 worked very diligently to adapt the landscape to themselves. They didn't look at such plants as grew around here and find uses for yucca and prickly pear. Instead, they cleared fields, dug ditches, and sowed the plants they were familiar with wheat, barley, oats, potatoes, apples, and peaches. They didn't domesticate the bison that roamed the prairie and mountain valleys. They exterminated the bison and, and imported the more tractable Herefords. And when they built towns, they constructed their settlements to conform to their visions of what towns should look like. By and large, they were from the Midwest. That meant the railroad depot was at one end of the main commercial street Think of Union Depot at the end of 17th Street in Denver. The streets were in a grid rather than radiating from a plaza or a village square. They planted trees and lawns to make the place look more like Iowa or Illinois that they came from, places that get 40 inches of precip a year instead of 15. Further, they didn't even plant native flora. They planted the familiar varieties, the varieties they were familiar with, the bluegrass and maples and all the rest. And to bring this vision to completion, they built expensive waterworks to make the desert bloom. This was all for aesthetics, to create a Midwestern environment of tree-shaded walks and lawns and gardens, an aesthetic that 
traces back to soggy old England. The New Mexico columnists who got here a little earlier had their own visions of how towns should look. The plaza with the church, not the railroad depot, was the focal point. Rather than build frame houses that needed extensive heating systems, they used thick adobe walls with fab fabricated from local mud. Rather than small yards with lawns for greenery, they built sheltered courtyards so that the harsh sun and wind wouldn't desiccate their plants. If the pictures I remember from my Sunday school books are accurate, that was also the architecture of the Levantine deserts. Houses of sun-dried clay were cons constructed as little fortresses with small courtyards within rather than set amid the verdant fields and forests made possible by irrigation. At any rate, if Colorado towns and cities had been built with mid-eastern mid architecture rather than midwestern, then our communities probably wouldn't be suffering from a drought since we wouldn't be using nearly as much water because we wouldn't have yards with lawns and trees. But then I look at my own domicile. Without the shade from the water-wasting trees, the house would be beastly hot, so I'd likely need to install an air, con an air conditioner. If there were no trees and gardens along the sidewalks with their shade and evaporative cooling, walking would be so unpleasant that I'd end up driving more. In other words, we, we might save water by adopting a different architecture, but there would be other costs, like rebuilding most of the streets so that every residential block looks something like Bent's Fort. You can adapt to the desert or make the desert adapt to you. The founders of modern Colorado took the latter course, and we're still trying to make it work. <laughs> I don't think I know how to get this all. <laughs> yeah, Maybe I'll just yank it. No yanking. No yanking. <clears throat> I better. So you've probably all heard of the uh, urban, rural, wild interface. Ed Quillen called it the stupid zone. <laughs> and this was written in 2002, but he wrote this more than once because I had a, a syndicate called Writers on the Range for High Country News, and I ran one. The Denver Post ran one, and then I think he, he kept writing about it because we didn't learn. We don't learn. And judging by current events, it must be time for another explanation of the stupid zone, a term I may have invented a few years ago. The stupid zone was proposed as a compromise. On one hand, there is private property with the associated rights to use your land. On the other, people want low taxes. These two forces collide when rural land is subdivided, subdivided and people start building houses on five or ten acre lots. They bought the land and they want to exercise their property rights by building houses and moving in. When they do this, they cause a need for government services. services. But do they pay their own way? Custer County in the wet mountain valley of Colorado was one of the fastest growing counties in the United States during the 90s. And most of that growth came in the form of rural residences on multi-acre lots. So there was a study to determine whether county taxpayers were better or worse off for all this conversion of agricultural land into residential land. It turned out that for every dollar that local governments, essentially the county and the school district, received in taxes from agricultural land, they spent only 54 cents on services. But for every tax dollar that came in from these exurban developments, they were spending $1.16 on governmental services. Thus, the working families who live in trailer parks in town we're subsidizing the folks who build 3,000 square foot houses on wooded 20 acre estates. But in modern America, that's not an issue that resonates with the public that keeps building sports stadiums to subsidize billion acre, billionaire team owners and millionaire athletes. Phrasing a question as, why are we taxing the poor to benefit the rich? 
just brings accusations that you're trying to start a class war. We already have other wars in process. Some of these rural subdivisions are in sensible places, but many are not. Most notably in recent years, some sit in tinderbox forests where devastating fires are merely a question of time. If a county tried to protect its taxpayers by zoning against such subdivisions, it would impinge upon property rights. But if it allows such developments, then it's forcing its taxpayers to subsidize them. The stupid zone resolves that dilemma. A county planning office would consult with every expert to determine where is it stupid to build houses, and people within these zones would be on their own. Mining historians would map old shafts. Foresters would identify wildlife potential. Geologists would be busy with rock slide and mudslide routes, major fault systems in swelling or unstable soils. Biologists would describe bear habitat. Once it was assembled, the county government would use it to draw stupid zones. People would be free to build wherever they wanted in the stupid zones, but local government would provide no services other than the absolute minimum. That is, the sheriff would serve warrants in the stupid zone, but there would be no routine patrols or investigations of property crimes. Stupid zone children could go to school but the district would not concern itself with their transportation. Roads in the stupid zone might be maintained or plowed, but by the property owners in the zone, not by the county. When wildfires broke out in the stupid zone, the local fire district would build its fire line at the stupid zone boundary. <clears throat> you get the idea by now. The stupid zone lets people do whatever they want with their property. It also reduces or even eliminates local subsidies for development. The state could take it a step further and require insurers to take stupid zones into account when setting taxes for homeowner policies. Shared risk is one thing, but why should you and I pay more just because some people want shake shingle roofs and wooden decks in a fire prone forest? And if the idea caught on, the federal government might adjust its firefighting and disaster relief policies. After all, just how many times should we all be expected to pay for rebuilding Florida after a hurricane? Stupid zones are a wonderful way to protect property rights and to reduce taxes. Republican political themes in a Republican state. Just when is some county going to take this sensible step? <laughs> my voice will carry anyway. My selection, Could the School Year Be Getting Too Long? September 4, 2001, by Ed Quillen, my colleague, mentor, and friend. By tradition today, the day after Labor Day should be the first day of school, and by the same tradition, the term would end on May 24, 2002, the Friday before Memorial Day. But such traditions are not much honored these days. Some schools start, started more than a fortnight ago during the torrid days of August, and some will not get out until June is well along. <clears throat> this tradition, start after Labor Day and then before Memorial Day, hold 180 days of classes in between, dates back more than a century to an agricultural America when children were needed on the family farm in the summer. That doesn't make much sense now, at least for the vast majority of school districts. In 1997, there were only 1.9 million farms in this country. Put a family of five people on each farm, and that's still only 3.4% of the population. So there's one argument against the traditional school year. Another facet of that argument is that this school year was determined by economic factors rather than the educational needs of children. 
That same argument is often employed here during discussions of the school calendar, although the economic factor is tourism rather than agriculture. If kids are out of school in the summer, then they can function as a labor pool for seasonal tourist enterprises. They make beds, wait tables, fry burgers, wrangle horses, etc. And since they're living at home, they're less likely to, to demand a living wage. Um, <laughs> further, the duration of our tourist season is often a result of other schools' calendars. The family trip to Colorado happens when the kids are out of school, and the shorter the summer vacation, the more congested the campgrounds and fishing holes and the more likely people are to go somewhere else next time. So it's in our economic interest for every school district in, in America to follow the traditional calendar with a long summer vacation. Again, though, the critics will correctly point out that this desire for a full three months of summer vacation is based on economic factors rather than the edu needs, uh, educational needs of the children. Assuming that a child's educational needs are the highest social priority, and must come ahead of matters like spending time with the family or earning some college money, then what school calendar would best meet these needs? A frequent criticism of the traditional three-month summer break is that kids forget a lot of stuff during that time so that the teacher has to spend the better part of September on review, which wastes time. That sounds sensible, but think about it. How well do you learn anything in the first place? if you forget it a hundred days later. <laughs> Assuming that you knew how to parse a sentence, solve a quadric equation, or recover from a Windows blue screen of death in May, don't you still know how to do that now? <laughs> if you had the skill in the first place, you're not going to lose it in a few months. So it would appear that this concern that children forget things during the summer is really a way to disguise the fear that they don't learn the material in the first place. <laughs> And perhaps that's where the attention should go, rather than to the school calendar. By this theory, that, that retention is better without a, a long break. Students in year-round schools should do better academically than students on the traditional calendar. But that's not the case. According to a 1998 study by the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, it compared students in year-round schools still 180 days but with short breaks scattered through the year to those on a traditional calendar. The conclusion? After controlling for possible effects due to district, grade level, gender, ethnicity, parental education level, prior achievement, and average school level achievement, there were no significant achievement differences between year-round and traditional calendar students in either reading or math. So the long break really doesn't hinder learning. What about lengthening the calendar to 200 or more days rather than the usual 180? Perhaps that's a good idea, but we might also consider that of the six hours at school, actual academic instruction typically occupies less than 40% of the time. There might be some room for increased efficiency in the existing days before we consider adding some. There's the deeper question of whether the time spent in school really matters. Abraham Lincoln did pretty well for himself with less than a year of formal education, and Thomas Edison spent less than three months in school. Of course, Lincoln could then make time for his voracious reading habits, and Edison for his experimenting with chemistry and electricity. That sort of educational adventuring is what a lot of us used to do in the summer when school was out. And it w worries me that if they keep stretching the school year, kids won't have time to learn. <laughs> Visiting Ed and Martha, <coughs> excuse me, in Salida was always a joy. The first time I found Ed out by the garage, which has that sign on it, explosives keep off. <laughs> he was smoking, of 
cool. <laughs> and then we take a trip around Salida and go to Martha's favorite haunt, the Salida Public Library, this wonderful Greek temple, and take a look there. And then we head down to Ed's favorite place, the Old Vic Tavern. Victoria The Old Victoria, in the Victoria Hotel. Uh, and Ed would point out the old photograph there of that bar a hundred years ago and how nothing had changed. That the stools, and if the stools weren't in the right place, we'd put them in the right place to match the old uh, photo. I also made the mistake of going to Salida to debate Ed on one of his favorite propositions. Do we really need Denver? <laughs> <laughs> even more stupidly agreed to do that at History Colorado uh, Museum. Uh, he won both times, of course. Uh, Ed was a fabulous journal, journalist, but also a wonderful historian. I think so many of us learned our Colorado history from him. And I was also privileged to learn it from Abby, who was in my Colorado history class, A-plus, as I recall, at uh, CU Denver. And we had Ed to thank for settling this issue, Coloradan or Coloradoan, okay. March 18, 2007. One problem with our state government is that it has rules that are not enforced, specifically Article 2, Section 30A of our state constitution. The English language is the official language of the state of Colorado. Just what that means is rather vague. Since it says English rather than American English, do our cars have bonnets, boots, and windscreens instead of hoods, trunks, and windshields? No court has ruled. So it falls uh, upon vigilantes like me to enforce official English. One frequent question asked is what to call a resident. Are you Coloradoans or Coloradans? The informal rule explained in the 1945 book, Names on the Land, by George R. Stewart. By and large, when a place name ends in O, you add A-N. Unless it is of Spanish origin, then you drop the O before adding the A-N. This observed rule appeared to work in practice. Idaho and Chicago derivative from Native American languages, but not Spanish language, and their residents are called Idahoans and Chicagoans. San Francisco comes from Spanish, hence San Franciscans. We also have Mexicans and Puerto Ricans. Since Colorado is a Spanish word for the color red, we are properly Coloradans, not Coloradoans. As best I know, most Colorado newspapers follow this rule, but there have been exceptions. <coughs> most notable, perhaps, is Fort Collins, Colorado. It is owned by the Gannett chain, which until 1989 also owned the daily newspaper in the capital of the land of enchantment, the Santa Fe, New Mexican. Consistency would seem to require either a Fort Collins, Colorado one, or a Santa Fe, New Mexico Mexico one. <laughs> At least when both papers are under the same ownership. At the Coloradan, state residents used to be Coloradoans, but now we're Coloradans, according to Jane Melton, Jason Melton, a copy editor at the paper. The change came a couple of years ago, and now the only Coloradoan published there is the paper's name. <laughs> the Pueblo chieftain also used Colorado, Coloradoan until a few years ago when it switched to Coloradan, according to my friend Hal Walter, a part-time copy editor there. However, consistency does not rule. The residents of Pueblo, a Spanish word for town, should be Puebloans, Pueblans, by the rule that gave us Coloradan, but in the chieftain, they're Puebloans. Puebloan is also uh, appears in the modern politically correct southwestern dialect in reference to the people who built at Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon a millennium ago. In recent years, I've been told that we should talk about ancestral Puebloans rather than Anasazi, 
since Anasazi derives from a Navajo term for enemy ancestors and is thus somehow insulting or perhaps demissive of modern Pueblo peoples because it ignores their ancestors' probable role in construction. I continue to use Anasazi. For one thing, it has no meaning in English other than the people who built that old stuff around the four corners. <laughs> For another, ever since the Pueblo chieftain didn't hire me back in 1983, I prefer to spell Pueblin, not Puebloan. <laughs> At any rate, our legislature seems to enjoy silly resolutions this year, so could the General Assembly please settle this issue and officially resolve uh, the residents of the Centennial State are Coloradans, lest some English-only fanatic try to make us color, color readians. <laughs> color readians. The resolution would be one small but useful step toward our own official English. My name is Cohen Perth. Uh, I, uh, I had the great fortune of being um, one of Ed Quillen's editors at the Denver Post during, um, during all the years that, uh, that he wrote these columns. Um, I say one of, editor, one of the editors um, because his most important editor was the first one, Martha, who clearly did a great job because I think in all the years that I edited Ed's column, I think I had to call him maybe twice to say, you know, this doesn't make sense or whatever, because um, I think Martha did a good job cleaning things up to start with. Anyway, so um, my, you know, my favorite Ed Quillen columns uh, were always his ones on, um, on holidays, and uh, this, one, this one I'm choosing to read uh, was one he did for Father's Day 2005. Um, so... On Father's Day, it's traditional to write about those wonderful times you had playing catch with Dad, about how he always came to your games and school events. Not for a moment of my life have I doubted that my father loved me and cared about me, and yet I can remember playing catch with him precisely once. His eyesight was bad, and he had so much trouble judging trajectory that he once got hit in the head at a bowling pin toss in Kremlin. <laughs> My dad ran a laundry and went to work at 5.30, six mornings a week, to fire the boiler so there'd be steam when the crew got there, and he stayed at the laundry until 5 p.m. He didn't have a lot of time or energy for my ball games or school productions, although he did attend a few. My dad did take my brothers and me hunting and fishing, and sometimes we camped in the mountains, but mostly I felt close to my dad because I worked with him, starting in 1964 at age 13 on the sorting table in the laundry. In the laundry, I acquired many skills, which have been utterly useless since then. In the past 30 years, I've never had to thread pipe, recover the rollers on a flatwork ironer, rod the flues of a boiler, rebuild a steam valve after grinding the seat, or lace a flat belt. It is, however, hard to express the sense of confidence I felt after he taught me how to make my own soap for a nasty washroom job. Some restaurant customers used gunny sacks to clean their grills, and every so often, they'd, stand the, they'd send these stinking, grease-laden grill wipes to the laundry. The trick was to follow the old home recipe for soap. Start with tallow, the bacon and hamburger grease caught in the cloth. Add lye, known as hot alkali in the washroom, and apply heat, superheated steam, while stirring the rotation of the washing machine. If you did it right, suds would appear in the froth of the washing machine, and your home-generated soap would build up and clean the greasy juke bags. When that's one of the high points, you know that a washman's job doesn't offer much excitement. <laughs> but there was a time at the laundry in Longmont when I saved my father's life. I was in the washroom tending to the Saturday afternoon chore of cleaning 600 pounds of shop wipers, those red rags that mechanics use. They were so filthy that they took about three times longer to wash than the usual stuff, like motel and hospital linens, so they always got put off until the end of the week. Dad was in the boiler room, working a set of clamshells to pull crud, mostly fragments of wipers and stringy mops, out of a sewer manhole. He leaned down to pull some recalcitrant object and then slipped. 
Eventually, I heard a muffled, Help! Help! from the boiler room, went back to investigate, and saw a pair of kicking legs sticking out of the floor. As soon as I stopped laughing, I pulled him out, realized that if one of my washing machines had drained while he was stuck there, he would have drowned. It's not that I wanted to be in that laundry then. My dad and his father had the crystal white laundry in Greeley where I began working. In 1968, my folks moved to Longmont where my dad managed the model laundry. I worked there on and off before my brief army career in 1972. Upon my discharge, it was my understanding that I had something like a constitutional right to 26 full weeks of unemployment benefits while I pretended to look for work. So I went to the state job service office ne next door to the laundry on Main Street to sign up for my paid vacation. The woman looked at my name and made an announcement. Your dad said you'd probably be by. He said to send you next door. He needs a wash man and you can start this morning. <laughs> My dad, my brothers, and I spent a lot of time together, working, going out for coffee, fixing cars, talking about machinery. We seldom had bleachers or an auditorium between us. You get to know people by spending time with them. There are a lot of ways that fathers can be fathers without ever tossing a ball. Happy Father's Day to the other Ed Quillen, the respectable one. pleasure of meeting Ed a time or two in person, but on Sunday mornings I always considered him a friend. And I also uh, consider him a little bit of a professional mentor because he considered himself a professional Coloradoan. And that's what I want to be. That's the career path I want. I'm on it. And so uh, I look to him. I often look to him for help with that. I picked when the Aspen fail in high country because I was recently flying above his, uh, around the Salida area and above Aspen in a small little Cessna reporting on some things and there were still so many golden trees and I was thinking about that and all the fires and floods that we've had recently in my hometown and this nagging sensation I have that something large and strange is afoot and so I, I appreciated this particular column of his which is from 2007. One benefit of living in the mountains is that you become an expert on what must be a major contributor to the buildup of atmospheric carbon dioxide that causes the Arctic ice cap to melt and the sea levels to rise, thus imperiling life as we know it. I refer, of course, to the changing color of aspen leaves, a spectacle which inspires myriads of metro residents to drive around the mountains this time of year, burning much gasoline in the process. Those Aspen viewers often spend some money in little mountain towns, thereby easing transition from summer when you might make a little profit to seven or eight very slow months. <laughs> Around Labor Day every year, I start getting inquiries. When are the Aspen going to be at the peak this fall? We used to figure around seven, September 17th, an easy date to remember in Salida because it's the average date of the first killing frost. But as of yesterday, a week later, there had been no frost in town and few surrounding aspens have changed colors. I check them every morning when I walk the dog along the river and railroad tracks just east of town. Along the way, there are several panoramic views that spread from the Sangre de Cristo to the Marnock Ridge. When the aspen chain change, great golden bands and patches glow on the mountain flanks, but it hasn't happened yet. Several theories have been advanced. These days, just about every untoward event gets blamed on global warming. And so if the climate is warmer, then the trees should stay in summer form longer. While global warming may explain some changes in scenery, it doesn't explain the aspen. The color change is not brought about by a decrease in temperature, but by the diminishing hours of sunlight. In a sense, the leaves don't actually change color. The tree responds to decreased daylight by halting its production of chlorophyll, the green chemical of photosynthesis that turns sunlight, air, and water into plant material. When the chlorophyll fades away, the yellow carotenoids that were present in the leaf all along become visible. This year, though, a lot of local chlorophyll is refusing to fade away, even though the days are getting shorter. Some locals have theorized that sudden aspen decline syndrome, observed with dying stand stands in the San Juan Mountains, could have moved north, but there's no real evidence for that. 
The most logical explanation is that we have more moisture than usual in July and August, with thunderstorms on many afternoons. According to Ann Ewing of the U.S. Forest Service Office, the wet conditions encourage the growth of, quote, aspen leaf blight fungus, which smites the leaves just as they're about to shut down for the year anyway. Basically, the leaves will just turn black and fall off instead of turning yellow, she said, adding that it doesn't seem to hurt the tree, though. On an excursion to Breckenridge a dozen days ago, I noticed a few golden aspen around Leadville, so I called a friend there yesterday for an update. He said the display still hadn't peaked and that the yellow doesn't seem as vibrant this year, but it should still be a pretty good show by the end of the week. Our aspen do seem to be acting up, mysteriously dying in the San Juans, refusing to change colors in the Central Mountains, changing later than usual in the high country. This could hurt, hurt tourism, but there may be a way around it. We know that people will come to mountains and spend money to see trees that have changed colors. And when I was in Summit County earlier this month, I saw thousands of trees that had been, been a rather monotonous gray-green, now displaying a diverse panoply of red, yellow, and orange needles. So if the aspen are failing us, we should quit complaining about the pine bark beetle epidemic that produces the colorful needles, and instead start promoting it as yet another glorious natural spectacle to admire and cherish, well worth up the trip from the city. <laughs> Well, these are all my favorites, which is why they're in the book, but I had to choose one, so um, I chose this one. It's timely to this time of the year, and it contains so much of what was good about my dad's columns. He manages to put together a homey family story with um, a history lesson, a political statement, and he strings together many jokes at the same time. So it's called Traditional Feast, Hard to Swallow, November 25th, 2001. One thing I'm very thankful for is that Thanksgiving Day comes only once a year. Not that I have anything against expressing gratitude. Such a list could run for pages, and even then it would cover only a few of life's daily pleasures. Simpsons reruns, a cozy fire in the parlor stove, an old dog that still enjoys a daily walk, public radio, Linux, and a small town with a high tolerance for eccentricity that sits far from scheduled air service or an interstate highway. My problem with the fourth Thursday in November has nothing to do with gratitude. I have plenty to be thankful for, and I don't mind saying so. The problem is that I don't care for turkey. Everyone else in the family likes it, and this is their annual opportunity to enjoy it in copious amounts. So I go along. I'm sure I'm not the only one who'd prefer ham or beef or even tofu to turkey. <laughs> Yet, while there are national toll-free hotlines to assist fowl cooks, I don't know of a single support group for people who would like to say neither when asked light or dark. <laughs> it makes one wish that the Founding Fathers had paid more attention to Benjamin Franklin, who argued the eagle was not a fitting mascot and the turkey would be an improvement. For the truth, he wrote to his daughter in 1784, the turkey is in comparison a much more respectable bird, mm -hmm. and Withal, a true original native of America. He is besides, though a little vain and silly, a bird of courage, and would not hesitate to attack a grenadier of the British guards who should presume to invade his farmyard with a red coat on. If the turkey were the national emblem, then the bird would be protected and we couldn't butcher and eat it, right? By contrast, Franklin wrote that the bald eagle is a bird of bad moral character. He does not get his living honestly. Too lazy to fish for himself, he watches the labor of the fishing hawk. And when that diligent bird has at length taken a fish and is bearing it to his nest for the support of his mate and young ones, the bald eagle pursues him and takes it from him. Thus, Franklin concluded, the eagle is like those among men who live by sharping and robbing, which makes me think that perhaps the eagle really is a better symbol. No, never. <laughs> Nosing around Franklin's work often brings up subversive material like they that can give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Thoughts, thoughts like that are inappropriate in these safety conscious times when the snoops have been empowered. Consider what happened recently in the city where Franklin conducted most of his career, Philadelphia. Neil Godfrey was attempting to board an airplane to Phoenix. He was detained and questioned for so long that he missed his flight and even after he was searched, he was not permitted to board. 
Why? Because he was carrying a book to read on the flight. The book was Hey Duke Lives by Edward Abbey. It has come to this in our land of the, of the free. You can't travel if your choice in reading displeases an airport security screener. Somehow, I don't think this is what Benjamin Franklin had in mind when he helped establish this country. But if you want to be on the safe side when you travel, I'm willing to help. Franklin, like Abby, wrote some insurrectionary prose. There is a chance that you'll encounter a literate security screener who knows about these works. Thus, you could get detained or worse if you happen to be carrying Franklin-related material. So, before you go to the airport, examine your wallet. If you find any engraved portraits of Benjamin Franklin, mail them to me at PO Box 548, Salida, Colorado, 81201. I'll take care of that problem. It's the least I can do to help ensure the safety of the traveling public. And I will be thankful for this opportunity to assist my fellow citizens. I am also thankful that the pilgrims landed in Massachusetts. Suppose they had made their way to the Great Lakes before settling down to farm in 1620. Instead of encountering Squanto, Somerset, and the Wampanoags, the pilgrims might have settled among the Arapaho and Cheyenne, who lived beside the Great Lakes before migrating to the western edge of the Great Plains in about 1800. A joint harvest feast could well have ensued, and naturally there would be indigenous cuisine. Our Thanksgiving tradition would not feature a roasted turkey, but instead a roasted dog. As far as I'm concerned, <laughs> the only good turkey is a wild turkey, especially when it's on the label of a whiskey bottle. <laughs> but no matter how thankful I am when we run out of Thanksgiving leftovers and I can return to palatable food, I am even more thankful that the pilgrims didn't land in Minnesota. Their traditional turkey is hard enough to swallow. <laughs> Um, I chose this for an odd reason because I thought it was boring <laughs> and, and that might sound odd but, but um, a girl where I work, I work at the Slida Library, is always saying, when you and Ed you would love this book because you were that crazy. <laughs> or, you, you know, she's always telling me to read things about drugs and, and sex and rock and roll. And I thought, this kind of shows that our family was fairly normal. But more than that, it says a lot about Ed because Ed always said that, that our kids had turned out to be such interesting people. And... There, life doesn't get better than that. And he really believed that. And so whenever I read this, I think, he thought everything about them was interesting, even when it wasn't. <laughs> so I'll read it to you. But the best thing about it is I love the last line, so I will try to get to the last line quickly. <laughs> okay. Procrastination is one of my major talents. And for the past month or so, I've had the perfect excuse for delay. Every time somebody has asked why I haven't yet done something I was supposed to do, I have replied, my older daughter's getting married on the 17th, and until that happens, it's real hectic here. I'm doing the best I can, but I'm sure you understand. And of course they do, despite all the talk of the decline of traditional family values and how they can be restored by electing sanctimonious right thinkers who will give their campaign contributors the keys to the public treasury, weddings are still a pretty big deal. Wedding customs do change, though. For about as long as I can remember, the father walked the bride down the aisle. Now it's more sensible both mom and dad can walk, the, walk with their daughter. So it came to pass that at the Rotary Amphitheater in Riverside Park on Saturday afternoon, Martha and I stepped on the path with our columbine. A few minutes later, County Judge Bill Alderton, wearing his robe of office over a snap button shirt, blue jeans, and cowboy boots, pronounced her married to Brad Donamiller. Until the spring of 1999, in the massacre at Columbine High School in Jefferson County, the usual response to her name was, oh, what a pretty name. I joked that it was an old youth phrase, youth phrase 
which meant my parents were hippies in the mountains. <laughs> but the name actually came from Zane Gray, more or less. We were living in Crumley when Martha was pregnant with her, and one of the local old timers said that Zane Gray had spent some time in Little Park long ago and that one of his westerns resulted from the visit. I made further inquiries and found the book The Mysterious Rider. It did take place near Crumlin, mostly at a ranch up the Troublesome, and the heroine's name was Columbine. I knew it as her state flower, of course, but had never thought of it as a person's name until I read the novel. It seemed pretty and appropriate, and Martha and I decided that if the impending baby was a girl, we would name her Columbine. In those days, prospective parents generally did not learn the sex of the offspring until delivery. And if the baby had been a boy, I was ready with Edward Kenneth Cullen IV, not very creative, I grant, but easy and traditional. Columbine and Brad both grew up in Salida. They sort of knew each other, even though they were three years apart and ran with different crowds. Brad was a football star, while Columbine was often in trouble for ditching pep assemblies. One of Brad's best friends was Nate Ward, and Nate's little sister Sarah was our daughter Abby's best friend for years. Brad's father, Jack, owned a shoe store and would occasionally drop by the newspaper office to complain about something or another that appeared in the Mountain Mail when I was its managing editor. However, I was forced to admit to Jack that last weekend that I had no specific recollections of his appearances because the last visits by people complaining about the newspaper were not so rare as to be memorable. <laughs> Brad went off to college, mines in CSU, and then a job with Hewlett Packard before he ventured into the dot-com boom just before it bursts. He's back in it now with web page design, search engine optimization, and the like. After high school, Columbine went to Iceland as a Rotary Exchange student for a year, then to Western State in Gunnison. She seems to have inherited one of my deficiencies, working 100 hours a week to keep from working 40. She comes <laughs> bar, makes jewelry, and guides river trips. That would make her fairly typical sliding, but she and Brad are buying a house in Bend, Oregon. Abby and her husband, Aaron Thomas, live in Eugene. Abby tells me that I'd like Oregon. It's a lot like Colorado, except it has trees, water, and Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll find out someday. For the time being, I'm just a happy father, glad that young people still have enough faith in each other to join together and face the future. <laughs> couldn't be here because she's in her last month of law school. Well, there you are. Oops, I forgot this. People like this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, just a quick concluding remark. I forgot to thank Tish and John Windsor, who are supporters of the Words to Stir the Soul event. They're not here tonight, but we're grateful for them. I forgot to thank the center staff who pulled these events together in a very excellent way. So thank you, center staff. Okay, this isn't going so well. I would like to thank Martha and Abby and Columbine, who couldn't be here, is with us in thought. I would like to thank you for letting us share an evening in memory of Ed Quillen. And I would like to thank you for an evening in which we could feel as if we were his kin and yours. <laughs>